Uh, hello, everybody, and good morning to all of you at the University of Bath that are, are watching today. Uh, my name is Robert O'Dowd. Um, I'm talking to you today from the University of León uh, in northern Spain. I don't know if any of you have ever been here. It's on the Camino de Santiago, a nice little town here in northern Spain. Um, I'm afraid I, I should be talking to you live, but I'm not able to because life, I'm afraid, has gotten in the way. And, but if you bear with me, I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to try and give you a brief introduction to, to virtual exchange, okay, and what that means. So let me see if I can do this. So now you should be able, all able to, uh, to see my screen, okay. Um, so I'm talking about uh, connecting students through virtual exchanges and what that means, okay. And let me uh, begin, let explain a little bit what I'm talking about and what I'm planning to do this morning. Um, I'm gonna have to move these toolbars, these Zoom toolbars around the screen so you can see things, every, everything okay. So first of all, what is, uh, why is there so much interest in virtual exchange? Okay, what are the reasons for it be becoming such a, such a topic of interest in university education? Uh, then secondly, have a look at what is virtual exchange and very importantly, what isn't virtual exchange? because there are many different types of digitalized virtual approaches to, to education happening now in universities around the globe. And virtual exchange is just one of them, okay? So I want to differentiate and clarify what exactly what we mean. And finally, uh, what are some you know, basic recommendations for integrating virtual exchange? And in this last part, I'll try to talk to those of you that are working maybe in university management or university administration, maybe in international offices, and then those of you that are actually teachers and that want to get involved in this. And just to, to point out that I provided uh, Isabella and your colleagues there at Bath with um, a document which has five or six pages of links to examples, to resources, to platforms, and that I'm sure they'll be happy to share with you. Okay, so everything that's mentioned here today, you'll be able to find in that document and lots more as well. So uh, first of all, so why are we interested in virtual exchange? Well. Universities in general are always looking for ways to, shall we say, internationalize their, their curriculum uh, to make, you know, um, the university experience a more internationally, uh, more international learning experience. But of course, the main way universities have tried to do that until now is by sending students abroad. Okay. And uh, I, re I appreciate that the UK is now no longer part of the Erasmus Plus program, but even when it was, you know, the Erasmus Plus program, which was considered such a huge success, okay, at mobilizing students, didn't really, you know, get as many students to move as we probably think it did, okay? Uh, if you look at the, the most recent data that I could find, you will see that, um, you know, only 8% of Euro European students did, had some kind of international learning experience uh, during, their, during their studies, okay? That means either work practice or studying abroad. And in the UK, you can see down there at the bottom, only 3% of, of, of the UK students were apparently involved in, it, in, in international mobility programs. Okay, so that is very, very low, right? Uh, so, and of course, so the universities are beginning to think, well, what other ways can we offer students international experiences? Of course, um, it goes without saying that the COVID has also had a big reason, has, has also been a big reason for, you know, making, um, virtual exchange an interesting prospect you know um, you can see that from this recent study about the impact of COVID-19 on higher education you know 60 percent of universities that were were you know involved in this survey said they had increased either what they call virtual mobility or collaborative online learning and collaborative online learning is a, another phrase I think referring to virtual exchange there okay so you know COVID if you like has pushed this and I've certainly seen this in the amount of work, online workshops, seminars, uh, conference events, all related to, you know, uh, virtual exchange, what it means and how it can be put into practice. You know, they, they have grown so much in the past year. It's incredible. So, you know, basically the European Commission says that, you know, internationalization should ensure that the large majority of learners who are not mobile also have a chance to develop the international skills required in a globalized world. Okay. Uh, so, you know, this is the idea that we'll get as many people to travel abroad as we can, but for those that stay at home, whether for economic reasons, for personal reasons, um, you, know, you know, there's got to be some way to, uh, to give them an international learning experience. All right. 
And of course, that's why we talk so much in university education about internationalization at home, internationalization of the curriculum, and of course, global, global citizenship and developing global citizenship in our students. So virtual exchange is one, it's not the only way, but it's definitely one, of, one good way we can try to do that. So let's you know, uh, define it, see what we we're talking about here, okay? Again, I have to move these toolbars around. Um, it's all about engaging groups of students in online intercultural interaction and collaboration with partners from other cultural contexts as an integrated part of coursework and under the guidance of educators or facilitators. Now, I imagine if, if I asked you before this, you know, what do you think virtual exchange is? You would have told me the first two parts. It's about bringing groups of students online together to collaborate, you know, and groups of students from different countries online together to collaborate. But, you know, there's two other parts that are very important. Uh, it's an integrated part of coursework. That means students are getting recognition for their work and getting credits for their work. And it is under the guidance of educators. That means that you, the teachers, when you do these kind of exchanges are getting involved, you're, you're moderating them, you're helping the students with their interactions, you're helping them to reflect on what they can learn from their interactions. All right, they are very, very important parts of what we mean by virtual exchange. Okay. And you're sitting here going yeah, but that isn't virtual exchange. What, I, what you're talking about here is COIL, for example. There are many different terms to refer to this. Uh, in the United States, there is a large movement, a large body of, of activity that goes under, under the term COIL, Collaborative Online International Learning. You can see this at the bottom. Uh, you, a lot of you, I believe, are in, in, fact, in, in schools of management and business studies. There, you might have heard the term global virtual teams. Okay, again, that's very similar. If you come from foreign language education, well, those top two might be familiar to you. Telecollaborative learning, online intercultural exchange, and e-tandem. Those three are very often used in foreign language education. All right. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to promote virtual exchange as a, some kind of umbrella term for all of these so that we all know what we're talking about. Okay, basically, it's, quite, it's very, you know, a very pragmatic approach. Because if we're all talking about different things about COIL, telecollaboration, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that way, you, you know, it can lead to confusion. It can mean that people are not reading the same research. They're not sharing their research effectively and things like that. So we're trying to get some kind of kind of global term, you know, that, that covers all of these different approaches and all of the, in all of these different contexts. One thing, however, that virtual exchange is not the same as is virtual mobility. Okay. And I would really insist on this. And this, I don't, I'm not saying this as some kind of form of competition. I'm not saying virtual exchange is better than virtual mobility. All I'm saying is that they are two very different ideas. Uh, wh why? Well, Virtual exchange, as we said, is getting students in different countries to collaborate together online. Virtual mobility is when students in higher education study for a short period at another institution outside of their country without physically leaving their home. So, for example, here at the University of León in Spain, during the COVID crisis, I had many students who could not go on Erasmus. So what did they do? They signed up uh, for the Erasmus agreement with their partner university in Poland, for example. Every week they logged on from their homes here in Spain and followed the classes that were happening in, in Poland. They did the exams that were offered in Poland. And at the end, their marks were sent home to the home uni university here in Spain, just like a normal Erasmus mobility. That is a virtual mobility, okay? But it is not the same as you can see as virtual exchange, all right? and I don't know if I hopefully you, you'll be able to see these despite all of these annoying toolbars appearing in front of you. Um, they, there you can see a kind of an, an overview of the differences. OK, virtual mobility students register with a foreign university, virtual exchange. They don't. OK, your students in a virtual exchange program continue as part of your class in your, your institution. OK, so I, I'll give you a second maybe to have a look at those. So, uh, so that's, the, I, that's one difference I wanted to, to highlight, okay? Now I'm going to move on and think about, you know, what are the key components of virtual exchange? If you are a teacher interested in running a virtual exchange, you know, what are the main things you should keep in mind or what are the main questions you should ask yourself? First of all, partnerships. Who will your students work with? You're going to have to find a partner class in some other country. 
Um, many teachers do that through their own academic networks from people that they know from conferences that are teaching the same thing, but in other countries. Uh, there's also organizations like Uni Collaboration that you'll find in the, in, the, in the list of links that I provide you with. And you know they, they've got a partner search tool and things like that that will help you to find partners. If your university also belongs to an international network, like the um, Utrecht ne Network of Universities or the Coimbra Group of Universities, some, one of these kind of modern networks, uh, you know, that can also be a good way of, of finding partners. The next thing you have to worry about are the tasks. What do the students do when they come together? Because it is not simply a question of getting them together and sitting back and watching the magic happen, right? You've got to provide them with tasks that are going to lead, to, lead them to collaboration and that are going to be related in some way to your subject matter, to what you're teaching, of course, right? Uh, the technologies, you know, what tools are suited to them? You know, what tools are appropriate in, in both classes? You know, it's, what tools will students have easy access to, right? Um, next one, mentoring and support. You as a teacher are going to act actively engage in mentoring and supporting your students, helping them to create their messages, helping them to organize their meetings, helping them to reflect on what happened during the meetings. Okay, and that is very important that, you know, during each class, <clears throat> if you give them a task to do with their partners over the weekend, that they have to meet in Zoom and discuss something, well then, you know, uh, the next day in class, you have to have a, maybe five, 10 minutes of your, of your class dedicated to, you know, feedback. What did they, what, what happened? What went well? What went wrong? What did you learn? For example, these type of things. Um, integration. How will students cr receive credit for their work? This is also very important because uh, students will not do anything after a while in these projects unless they get, know that they're going to get a final part of their grade, their final grade for this work. So what you might want to do is ask them to write maybe a project or an essay or a portfolio based on what they have done during their project, a class presentation based on what they've done during their project and replace some other form of continuous assessment that you normally do with that, you know? So that's one way to do it. And finally, and this is more a message for the university management, if your teachers are going to go to the trouble of doing all of these things and innovating their teaching in this way, they also deserve credit for their work. You might give them a small deduction in teaching time. You might give them a micro grant so they can travel and meet their partner teacher somewhere so they can plan the meeting, plan the, the project. Um, you know, you can maybe if, if you have a system in your university where, student, uh, where teachers can get promotion, Maybe this can be one way that they can, you know, that will contribute to the promotion process. Okay, you know, there are different ways that it can be done, but you know, teachers deserve the tr being recognized for the trouble they go to to engage in one of these projects. Okay, um, how is it being integrated into international education? Three different ways, basically: pre-mobility, blended mobility, and class-to-class -class virtual exchange. Pre-mobility is very simply before your students are sent abroad on one of their international mobilities that you put them into contact with somebody uh, in that target university or in at least in that target country so they can prepare for their physical mobility. I don't know about you, but before I was sent on my Erasmus program from Ireland to, to France many years ago, I was given a phone number of the residence where I was staying and that's how I was prepared for physical mobility. Uh, you know, I hope, I think nowadays it's done a lot better and this can form a way of preparing students for their physical mobility programs. Second point, blended mobility. This is going to come, uh, it's not very popular at the moment, but it is going to become important because it's a new part of the new Erasmus Plus program. And that is blended mobility means combining stages of online collaboration with short stages of physical mobility. So students maybe working together on a project online and then traveling and meeting together in one of the partner universities to conclude that project, okay? That is going to be a really interesting way that this will develop in the future, I think. And the third one, class to class virtual exchange is the basic classic one, where you have your class in Bath, my class in Leon, and we, the two teachers, we work together to prepare um, the tasks. We run the, we run the exchange together and things like that. So now, stages of a, a class to class virtual exchange. This is what it looks like. Um, first of all, uh, a teacher in Spain teaching a course on ecological issues, for example, in tourism studies, contacts a partner teacher in Ireland working on the same theme. Okay. Then what happens? Well, 
Robert gets his computer to work properly. Then, it, then there you go. Teachers negotiate the tasks, the timetable, and the assessment pre teacher, uh, procedures. So this takes a while, obviously. You know, you try to do this normally the semester before your exchange. Okay, and then you will, teachers will also agree on a virtual learning environment, for example, Moodle, which will be the base where the students will be, work together. And normally you will separate your students into working groups, maybe of four Spanish students and four Irish students in, in this case. Uh, why? Because if you had 30 students from one country and 30 from another all working together, it's going to be chaos. So you need to break them into small working groups and each working group will do the same, they will all do the same tasks. And then stages of interaction. Normally there's three stages. First of all, they get together for the first time and they introduce themselves. Maybe they make a short video introducing themselves and, you know, and their, their lives and their context. So they get to know each other a little bit. And you give them a Zoom meeting, but also with icebreakers. So you tell them how you know, to find three things in common, three things that they are different or whatever. Stage two, uh, students carry out a survey of ecological practices on their campuses and compare their findings. Uh, this is kind of a comparative. Normally, the second stage will be a comparative study. So in Ireland, they do this. In Spain, they do this. And then they talk about the, the differences they find. And the third stage, which is the most complex, students identify a problem that they, that they want to solve. And they work on this together to make a video proposing a solution to the problem. So this is a lot more collaborative and requires a lot more in negotiation. It's a lot more intense. Okay, so you see that this, the, the different tasks get gradually more complex as time goes on. Okay. And finally, grading. Students will then submit a portfolio um, and maybe present a, uh, make a presentation in class showing what they've done during, on their work and then also um, you know, reflecting on what they've learned. Okay. Why do we do ask them to do this? Because you as teachers are not going to be able to follow maybe 10 different working groups as they meet on Zoom they write messages and emails and, and work on Google Docs together. It's impossible to try and keep track of all of this. So you ask them for a portfolio where they show you the most important things that they did and they reflect on what they've learned from it. Okay, and I'm not going to try and show this now because it would probably make my, my Zoom recording crash. But this is a link to you know that, uh, one of the videos that those students between Ireland and Spain made about the Ecological Citizenship Project. And uh, maybe Isabella or her colleagues there can, can take out this link, uh, send it to them separately and share it with you, just to give you an idea of you know, what students in two countries can do together when they, when they work well. Okay, what do they learn from this kind of experience? Well, what you will notice is that apart from language skills, students learn an awful lot of what we call global skills or transversal skills that we are you know, always told that in universities we should be preparing our students for, for, the, for the modern workplace. So they talk about, you know, I learned how to be patient working in groups, how to adapt myself to tricky situations and how to use new innovative teaching strategies. Most of all, adaptability and flexibility, working with people from different countries and with different timetables teaches you how to be patient and forces you to find a common place and time in order for your collaboration, collaborative project to succeed. And another student mentioned, the fact of working with people from other countries prepares us for the future problems that we may have. That is to say, we learned how to face problems of timing and agreement. Uh, I also learned that we have to understand and respect other people's thoughts, okay? So, I mean, think about these, time management, empathy, intercultural skills, collaborative skills, adaptability. These are the type of skills that your students are going to be able to develop in these type of projects. And if you think about, you know, this is just a, a document from a couple of years ago from LinkedIn about the skills that companies are looking for in our students. Okay, creativity, persuasion, collaboration, adaptability, time management. Look, number three, four, and five, you know, they, they are mentioned by my students coming out of that virtual exchange. You know, so this is, I think, proof that it's relevant to what we're trying to do, no matter what subject you're working in. Okay. And if you want more evidence of this, the Erasmus Plus Virtual Exchange Program, another one of the links that you'll find in this document that I'm sending you, um, they too have found that students develop teamwork, collaborative skills, problem-solving skills, digital competences, critical uh, thinking skills. You know, all of these things are developed through virtual exchange programs. 
Okay. And as I know that a lot of you that are there today from, um, I believe, faculties of business studies or, or similar, similar areas, I really r recommend that you have a look at the X Culture project. Again, also in the set of links. But if you Google X Culture, I think you'll find this. Uh, this is a wonderful, wonderful um, initiative uh, where students from all over the world that are studying management and uh, marketing are brought together online comp and the, the organizers get companies to send them problems. We want to send, sell this type of car in this market. How can we do it? And the students have to work online with international partners, international student partners, and come up with whatever it is, you know, a proposal for how the a marketing strategy or whatever. Uh, there's a lovely video that explains it very nicely. And it also explains how you can sign up for, for this project. Okay, so this is something, maybe even if you didn't get your students involved in X-Culture, you can use that as an idea of how to, you know, get students of business involved in this type of learning. Okay. okay. Uh, finally, what role for international offices and university management? Well, here are just a few suggestions that I would ask you to keep in mind. Um, develop a virtual exchange strategy, which aligns to your, your current internationalization strategy. Um, prefer, prepare information and dissemination, dissemination events to explain the concept of virtual exchange. A little bit like your, your colleagues uh, Isabella and, and her colleagues have gone to the trouble of doing today for you. Um, identify individual faculty members could be champions who can say, look, this is the, the type of thing that we have been doing, you know, and it, this works. And I believe today in your, in your talk, uh, that is exactly what you're going to do. You're going to have colleagues from, from your faculties talking about their experiences. So that's really good. Um, organize training events for teachers. Um, identify networks where your teachers can find partners. Okay. Collaborate with university management to link virtual exchange with teacher promotion. Because like I said, teachers won't do this for very long if they're not getting some kind of recognition for it, okay? And maybe identify funding opportunities for travel to meet partner teachers, okay? That I think is also very good. Some universities are doing this and it, it works very well. And finally, some overall advice for the, for the teachers there as well, okay? Do not see virtual exchange as competition or as a replacement for physical mobility. Nobody is suggesting that six weeks online collaboration online is the same as a year's Erasmus study in the south of France. Okay, nobody's suggesting that. Okay, so, but we should see it as a complement to it, how it can be combined together. Okay, uh, virtual exchange is not a question of matching your students together and then sitting back. Teachers have to get involved in mentoring and supporting these exchanges. Okay, and that is, and maybe teachers need help in preparing how to do that. Um, Virtual exchange requires integration into the curriculum and explicit recognition of students' learning outcomes. It should be a prepare, it should appear in your in your syllabus, in your course syllabus. You know, explaining, you know, 10% or 15% of your final grade will be the based on the outcomes of this project, et cetera, et cetera. And like I said before in the previous slide, but it's worth saying again, if teachers are going to go to the trouble of doing this, they need support, okay? Technical support training, academic recognition in some form, okay? So um, this is my very rushed introduction to virtual exchange. I hope it just give you a brief idea about what it is and what it isn't and how it differs to virtual mobility. There are many, many resources and platforms out there that support it more than ever, okay? Uni Collaboration is the organization we set up in Europe to support this, but you also have Erasmus Plus Virtual Exchange. The Stevens Initiative in the United States also supports and offers many um, project funding as well for, for projects related to virtual exchange. All of these links and are available on the document that I've provide, provided you with. Okay, so I hope this will be of some use to you. And if any of you want to, to follow up, I'm happy to receive emails and I'll get back to you if I can at all. Okay, so thank you very much and I, I hope the rest of your day goes very well. Thank you. Well, I'm saying thank you, but I haven't been able to stop yet. Hang on. <laughs>